Okay, welcome back to a slideshow for Victory Garden. This is spring 2011, March 16th, and the ornamental pears in our neighborhood are in full bloom. We've always considered this to be the first sign of spring, and uh, I, I like to think of it that way. Um, you know, spring really... I don't like to consider spring until it stops freezing, which can be May 1st, but uh, when it, when trees are blooming and your lettuce is growing, uh, that's spring enough for me now that I'm into gardening. So let's move on to the actual garden. And this is the 23rd of March with the uh, ornamental plum also in full bloom. So uh, not just the pears, the plums, everything is coming out and signaling that we are heading for warmer days. And not just the large species. Uh, look at the henbit and dead nettle in our yard. We just had this mass of purple flowers that most people would be uh, reaching for the miracle grow at this point and just dousing their lawns with chemicals. But since we've decided to move to permaculture, we are embracing this. We're embracing, uh, embracing the weeds, embracing nature's weed army. It's coming out here doing work uh, when we aren't doing work. It's feeding those pollinators. Uh, you know, we didn't have anything planted out yet. And so the fact that Mother Nature is going to lend us a hand here is most welcome. You can also see that the large pond, the main outline of it has been dug out, so you can see just how large that is, but it's still only a shovel, uh, shovel length deep, so it's not going to hold almost any water, uh, but that's a good thing considering I haven't, you know, I wouldn't want it to be full of water when I'm trying to dig it out. Moving on to another picture here, this is from the berm, so you can see even more of these uh, flowers from the head and bit and the dead nettle in the foreground. We have a raspberry bush that's beginning to leaf out. The uh, the garlic is still looking strong, as is uh, even the transplanted clover and dandelions in that uh, bed that runs down the contour. In the background, you can see a tiller. And after double digging all of the upper section of the garden, which you're going to be seeing here in a second, and about half of the next section, uh, I was getting pretty physically tired. I was doing most of the most of the work uh, by myself. I did get some help from my parents, uh, but really there's nobody else around who's interested in uh, digging for four to six hours a day. So you're out there by yourself, and when you're offered a tiller, you kind of go for it. Um, didn't remove all the manual labor, though, because I still had to strip off all the sod. And after stripping off all the sod, I've got this compacted clay, and the tines are not going to go into compacted clay, so I'm still using a pick, a mattock, uh, a turning fork, and the shovel. I'm still using all of those tools, but now instead of uh, wrenching my wrists trying to break up the clay with uh, the turning fork, I'm able to use the the tiller for that and I didn't really enjoy using it too much it does wipe out any kind of earthworm population you might have um, so it's it's not a very friendly tool <laughs> to say the least but it did get the job done and, and save my uh, save my wrists moving to the next set of pictures this is April 6th um, indoors looking at some of the plants that were starting inside. Again, I wouldn't ever start tomatoes indoors again in that type of climate. Um, they just don't need to be started indoors. You may get some early, you may get some early tomatoes, uh, but it's a lot of work, a lot of effort to keep them watered. Uh, you're using electricity on the lights, and I found that our volunteer tomatoes, the, vol the tomatoes that just come up, by themselves from last year's seeds or seeds that you may even sow uh, towards the end of winter or early spring, those are going to be so much stronger than anything you're going to transplant. Here's the green gill. This is the first section of the garden that we double dug. Um, this is most of it anyway, and we've planted out lettuce, spinach, uh, arugula, mustard, and a few other greens. second section of the garden. This is what would become the nightshade guild. Uh, we planted our tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and their companion plants in here. This has all been double dug. 
we don't have any mulch from the city yet, so I'm using that half-finished compost as a mulch until we were able to go and get some more. And I had so much of it that I was able to fill both of the swales and that uh, overflow ditch with leaves so that way we wouldn't get quite as much mud running down into the pond. Another view. Now this is the upper pond holding water fairly well even though it's not compacted but it's heavy clay. So the heavy clay uh, is the pore sizes aren't quite so big so after a few seasons uh, it, it should seal itself. This is closer of the lower end of that pond so it's going to overflow in the direction to the top of the screen and I put a couple berms there to slow that water down and hold it uh, and so that way the dynamic accumulators that I plan on transplanting into there you can see there's actually a comfrey plant already uh, starting to emerge um, they're going to be able to take advantage of the extra water that we get another view of the garden this is from the most southern end of the garden looking at that green guild down to the nightshade guild and you can see part of what would become the four sisters guild uh, and in this picture you can see just how much the willow tree is leaning and you can see why we had to put up some kind of supports for it looking east uh, just how green everything is starting to emerge the grass is kind of slow but the chickweed henbit dead nettle uh, all of all of these common weeds are flowering and they're offering solar energy to animals now they're giving up uh, nectar, they're giving up pollen so they can reproduce and it's just, it's a wonderful sight when you up, try to start appreciating plants as individuals, as individual species and what they can do for you and what they're doing for others instead of just trying to force uh, your standards of beauty onto nature. Here we are with our nightshade guild plants uh, outside getting acclimated to sun, temperature, and most importantly wind. I did set up a fan inside, uh, but you really need to give them some wind resistance, otherwise they're going to flop over once you get out outdoors. Let's move on to our next set of pictures. We're going to jump to the 15th of April, and it was a nice clear day, so I got to take some really good pictures from the upper windows of our house. Um, I like these aerial views. I wish we were able to get more of the Nightshade Guild, which is the one that's on the right and all mulched. Um, but you know, just due to the way the house is, it's not quite possible. But you can see how I've laid out the pathways for the Four Sisters Guild. Now, there aren't any keyholes here. I didn't put any keyholes. And that's because the running plants that are going to form the understory or the mulch layer, the living mulch layer of your four sisters need a lot of space to run and I didn't want to have to deal with them running over our pathways. So instead I just put no alternating nodes uh, so that you could have space to reach into the garden. Another view from the windows looking north um, remember this is sloping down until you get to that berm which is on the other side of the pond and so with probably a good five six foot slope and looking straight out the window I'm not really putting pointing the camera down look how tall this willow oak is this is a really tall tall tree and I was hoping to have some beds around it as well in between it and the uh, the birches where you can see I've laid out some pathways or some ideas of what they might end up looking like and never got around to it. Um, never got around to it for a few, quite a few reasons, not just being tired from uh, double digging, but once the double digging was done and the transplanting was in, you were caring for plants and so you can only do so many things at once. A few days later on the 18th, we're beginning to warm up our soil in the Nightshade Guild. We're warming the soil uh, so we can transplant our tomatoes in there. And you can see that we've brought in uh, wood mulch from the city and underneath the wood mulch there's some compost. And it was a leaf compost underneath this mulch. The leaf compost 
The leaf mold was amended with an organic soil conditioner that had beneficial microorganisms inside of it. That way we could begin jump-starting the process. This is all, I wouldn't say it's sterile, this mulch and compost, uh, but it's definitely not produced in such a way that most permies would do it and have all sorts of uh, you know, really good uh, inoculation rates. So we wanted to bring in some of those beneficial organisms right off the bat along with the uh, fungi that we were inoculating all the plants with as well. And underneath even the compost into that first layer of soil along with the lime we had to work in an organic fertilizer, a low organic fertilizer. All the, num all the numbers were less than 10 and you know just the normal uh, bone meal, feather meal, fish meal, uh, those type of things. And that way we could boost our phosphorus levels and everything else that were just so abysmally low like our phosphorus on most of these places when we tested, we tested I think six different locations in our uh, garden uh, before doing anything were less than 20. So when you have less than a 20 count on your phosphorus and you just want to stick in a whole bunch of tomatoes, you're not going to have great success. So I, we thought that amending it with some organic fertilizer as a one-time amendment would be a smart way to go in order to get some kind of yield for all of this manual labor we were doing. You can see that on the berms of the swales, we have planted some crimson clover, and you can't make that out from the pictures, that's what I'm telling you, and the clover there just to, uh, you know, fix nitrogen and provide more nectar for the bees and everything else that we're trying to attract, because you can see our, our yard's really dead. There's, it's mostly just grass. I mean, sure, there was some henbit and dead nettle, but there aren't any um, you know, summertime sources of nectar, so we had to start thinking about that. Here's a picture of some uh, purple mustard and arugula growing in the green guild. Uh, comfrey that's on the swale. Comfrey that was on the swale did a whole lot better than the ones that were on the upslope of the swale. They benefited much, much, much more from the water that we were capturing. Just another picture. This is, you know, standing up, zooming out. The same comfrey plant from the last photos in the bottom right hand corner of the screen so you can get that sense of how much space uh, we're going to be planting for tomatoes and peppers and such. Moving to the 19th, I've now transplanted uh, along with the help of my mother, she really enjoys transplanting everything and we had it worked really well as a team uh, digging the holes down, pruning the tomatoes up to their you know last leaves, sticking them in there, getting them uh, sprayed with some compost tea and everything to help reduce the transplant shock. And so once we were done uh, trekking around, moving all the mud around, we were able to bring in that pine straw and put the pine straw in uh, to you know reduce the growth of all of the grass that's still underneath these pathways. Now that two sections of the garden are finished, we need to start moving to the Four Sisters, which is this area the pathways are laid out that's talked about from the uh, upstairs windows. You can see those windows that I took the, uh, the photographs from. And I've sheet mulched around this birch tree, I've sheet mulched around all of the trees that we're doing this work around. And I felt bad because we were obviously getting into their root zones with this double digging, but at the same time we were adding organic fertilizer, we were adding beneficial organisms, and we were adding organic uh, matter to it. So they, their health improved, I, I mean I can't really put a number on it of course, but you'll see once we get to 2012, I'll probably bring some of these pictures back and show you uh, from around the same time of year, just the the amount of leaves that they've put out, you can tell that all the trees are benefiting from uh, our application of permaculture. Here's a picture of those hueculture mounds. They're being built up with the sod that I'm scraping off when I'm double digging. Blueberry mound. This blueberry mound has four blueberry plants in it. It's not a very big mound, but the thing was uh, my father knew somebody who was going to offer us some blueberry plants for free, 
and I was hoping we'd go dig them up, but I came home from work one day, and there was a box full of blueberries, and we weren't ready for them yet. I hadn't finished all the Hugo culture beds. I hadn't finished everything else I wanted to do, but they were weak-looking plants. Their uh, root structure was um, you know, almost non-existent, so went ahead and hurried and planted four into this bed, four into uh, another mound that's inside the fence, and then uh, the berm extension also received some blueberries. And they're planted close because, like I said, they weren't very healthy, and I expected some loss of life here. Here's the garlic that I've been showing you that's been growing. Again, remember, no uh, organic fertilizers, just a little bit of compost as a top dressing. Another view of the garden showing, again, the scale of the project that we're undertaking this year. Uh, considering I'm doing most of the manual labor, I uh, did most of the double digging by myself. I did get some help uh, now and then, but for the most part, it was a one-man operation, uh, which is rough going when you've got a full-time job that you're also attending. Here's our strategic materials dump. Uh, this is where we would obviously dump off all our mulch and our compost from the city. And it worked out well. It was just really easy to back up the trailer, scrape everything off, then go back, get some more loads before going to work. And we went through, you can tell, the, the si look at those shovels, the size of these piles. These are usually about uh, three, at over three yards of mulch per trailer. So um, quite a bit of organic material being imported. And again, this is something that we're doing initially. Um, we are planning on cover cropping later on in this season. And we did. Um, so initially we needed to bring in some organic matter because otherwise we would have had bare soil. And this is something we won't be doing continuously. We have brought in soil in 2012, not soil, but uh, mulch and a little bit of compost in 2012 to help extend the garden. But we're not going to be doing this year in and year out like some others do. Um, you know, that's it's up to you what you want to do. But we're going to be trying to move to as much self-sustaining fertility on our own site, uh, bring in that capital to begin with as an initial investment, and then build on that investment rather than continually bringing in things. Um, this way, I think it's a little bit more honest uh, about how how well permaculture can work as a closed-loop system. This is some comfrey that we've planted out in our zone five. These were small. Uh, pieces of root that I didn't know if they would sprout and I also didn't really have a location that I really really wanted them to grow inside the garden so I put them out here and this is where I get most of my roots from now in order to transplant. The rest is zone 5 you can see those comfries on the left I uh, still have a whole lot of leaves going on over here and you can see this look at this slope this is uh, leading up to that berm there it's it's actually quite steep and we do have some plans for that. We'll get to it probably in the summer is when I was able to finally get out back there and start doing some swales. Now we're on the 28th of April. Green Guild starting to take off. Uh, look at the plant spacing. Very wide spacing. We could have put in quite a bit more plants, a lot more seed, but being new, I was wary about overcrowding. Um, I was just, I was very conservative. And you can also see on the bottom left-hand corner of this screen is easiest. Uh, these clumps of green that don't look like uh, edible greens, these are white clover seeds. We sprinkle white clover seeds along the entire uh, perimeter of all these beds in the Green Guild in hopes that we would have a walkable footpath. They did invade the double dog beds, which is to be expected, but you can always just cut those back as mulch, and that way encourage them to uh, colonize this um, the pathways. Another view, Green Guild and the Nightshade Guild in the back. Well manicured. This looks real well manicured. This is something that uh, my parents liked because it wasn't so messy to begin with before they were really into um, and embracing uh, permaculture. The plant spacing on this was actually too close. The, the tomatoes could have been spread out um, quite a bit more. 
they begin to overcrowd each other as the summer went on. But you can see that we've got some ba different types of basil planted out and everything. Uh, starting to do some companion planting. Nothing ingenious. Uh, this is all standard stuff. Yeah, nothing mind-boggling. But it, was a, it is a polyculture. Here's uh, one of our comfrey plants that is already in flower. First year from a root already setting out its flowers. It's amazing to see these plants just continue to grow no matter what happens. Double digging beginning in the Four Sisters Guild. Here's the bog area. Uh, there's another comfrey there by that rock wall and some more rocks to hold the, uh, the mulch in. Whenever the water would overflow, it's going to pick up this mulch and just run with it. And I also transplanted some horsetails into here that we had growing in, um, in actually a really terrible location. There wasn't enough sun for them. So I dug them up, put them in. They didn't respond very well to it initially, but over the last two years, we now have quite a huge crop of horsetail, which is excellent for making your compost tea. And as a wonderful dynamic accumulator, putting it in, in the way of this uh, flowing water was a good idea to help trap some of the nutrients. Here's just another view of the garden. Um, nothing too spectacular, of course, but you know, for a first year garden, I think it looks pretty good. Now we're going to move into May. Let's see what's going on in May. May 8th, uh, nothing too fancy again here. This is just some cosmos already flowering from being transplanted. Cosmos puts out a lot of flowers and a lot of seeds. So be wary of it if you don't want it to take over your garden. You've got to make sure that it's got some competition. Uh, and it's not native, so I wasn't too happy with how easy it was dispersed. We actually managed to, later on, once I came back in the summer, at the end of summer, we harvested as many seeds as we could to keep them from just dominating the next year. 14th of May, we're seeing our first uh, harvest from the Green Guild. This is packed away into a basket, and here it is unpacked. Unpacked, it actually is quite a bit of... Uh, of leafy greens. Look at all this arugula and two types of lettuce and uh, some mustard. And just think about the savings when you spend, I think it's a dollar eighty for a packet of lettuce seed. And this is just one harvest. Uh, if you were to try to buy organic lettuce at the supermarket, or you're going to try to buy organic lettuce from the farmers market, you're going to pay a whole lot more than uh, two dollars for it, and especially more than two dollars. Uh, considering two dollars is going to give you lettuce for uh, throughout most of the season and then when it seeds you're going to have it for next year so you know growing your own at least when it comes to leafy greens is a good way to go to save money it's not calorie heavy by any means uh, not trying to say we're feeding our family with this but it's a start it's a sign of things to come here's a picture just depicting the size of comfrey leaves look at these leaves uh, with my flip-flop next to it, huge. I can see why comfrey is held in such high regard for its ability to produce biomass. Cucumbers transplanted out. Shouldn't have transplanted cucumbers in our environment. Uh, our climate's just so warm that it was unnecessary. Moving to the 21st. Take a look at this. Corn. Who transplants corn? Well, I didn't mean to. This wasn't something I initially set out to do. I was double digging the Four Sisters. I had estimated how long it would take me to complete it, and uh, my, my estimation was wrong. Uh, unfortunately, I had gotten a little bit too self-confident on how much I could get done in a day, and so I was like, well, you know, within a week I'll be done. So I'm going to soak my corn so that I'm not going to lose any more days. Um, you know, this is get, it was getting towards the middle of the end of May, and I didn't want to plant corn, you know, the first of June. So let's let's get them started. Well, you know, things happened at work, more hours than I expected, and everything like that. So didn't get the digging done. And what happens when you soak corn? It's going to sprout. So I, I hastily put it into some trays. 
Uh, there's like 50 corn plants in this one, and I had another one with another 50. And I was hoping I'd get the double digging in time uh, by before they were, you know, more than maybe four or five inches tall. These are over a foot tall. Um, it led to a lot of problems later on. They were just really weak plants. But let's move on to this next picture. Just how fast the growth is. Our arugula is already bolting, which uh, I was I was just dismayed at that. But let it bolt. Let it add flowers. We again, like I said, we don't have a lot of nectar going on here. So whatever's going to do, it's going to do. And I'm trying to learn. So if I'm continuing to set things back and trying to be that standard organic gardener. Um, you know, trying to dominate my plants. I'm not going to get as much out of it. You can see a forest of bamboo. Here's that forest of bamboo up close, uh, making trellises for my, well, actually not really trellises, they're cages for the tomatoes. Here's a picture of the maple tree. Take a look at this maple. Remember how damaged it was by that disease in that other picture from another slideshow? and how much it's already repaired itself by having again having this access to loose soil that has organic good organic fertilizer amended pH uh, organic matter being integrated by the earthworms pulling in that compost uh, the mycorrhizal fungi yes we did have endomycorrhizal fungi inoculant but in the soil conditioner they included ecto and endomycorrhizal spores so I'm fairly certain that some of these maple these maple trees and these other like the willow tree I'm sure they managed to find at least a couple of those spores and beginning that network of support in the garden uh, talking about support and look at the willow tree that we had to support it was you know leaning well to its side and we have it staked up uh, the prevailing winds coming from the southwest so putting the stakes parallel in order to give it support but not hold it up to the point where it was going to rely upon the aid we were giving it. This is a close-up of a polyculture, emerging polyculture, tomatoes, garlic, peppers, cilantro, oregano, uh, basil, cosmos. This was our most diverse guild. We had at least 10 different species growing in here. Uh, this was probably our best success in terms of experimenting with polyculture. Now this is the end of the nightshade guild uh, abutting the swale and this is where we planted our eggplants, kept them away from the tomatoes just to give them more space. Um, they didn't take too well to transplanting and they were immediately attacked by bugs. It took them months to recover but we did get some eggplants out of them. Um, really demanding plant. I think they would have. They, they'll do better. All these plants will do better as the years go on. A trellis that we built over the pond I was going to have the cucumbers. You can see some cucumbers that are along the edge of these beds on the right, and they're going to grow. Hop onto the trellis. And in that way, they're going to shade the water and keep it from evaporating quite as often. And if you look dead center at the screen, actually in the pond, see some green? It's water hyacinth. Yes, I know it's like the most invasive plant in the world. But the only way it's going to get invasive is if you allow it to go to seed. Uh, we're not connected to any waterways. Our ponds are not anywhere near a natural stream or lake. There's no way these plants are going to float away, get out from our fence, and reach a water course so as long as we manage to stay on top of them and cut every single flower as soon as it emerged even though they're beautiful as soon as we saw them come out and get you know out chop them off chop them off and you're going to be left with a nutrient accumulating biomass i mean it puts comfrey to shame you know it grows so quickly and it's going to be helping to clear up the water. Again, you can see it here in this picture as the cucumbers are getting ready for their leap uh, onto the trellis. Here's another picture of cucumbers you know, starting to take my guiding squash. Some squash emerging in the Four Sisters. We were bright enough not to try to start these in containers and transplant them out. Um, but take a look at this next picture here. 
Look at this squash plant. This is a volunteer. That's the difference. This is the same day. This is the difference between having volunteer volunteer seeds or if you want to winter sow some of your seeds out into the garden. In our climate, it doesn't get so cold that it's going to kill them off. So as soon as the conditions are right, they emerge. And look how large this squash plant is as a comparison to seeds just emerging that we decided to plant on our own schedule. And that seed came up from uh, the compost that we got from the city. Here's some vetch. This is a, I, it almost looks like a common vetch, but it was growing out behind our fence line, so in our zone 5. Um, I'd like to say it's a native, but I'm not sure. But it's neat to start seeing these once you recognize what the plants are supposed to look like uh, to see how nature's working. And this is the last picture for May. Uh, this is looking east. This is looking from those two birches where all the water runs through. You can see we've mowed. Uh, we try to keep the grass uh, at a higher rate than usual. You know, put the mower all the way up. And uh, this way we weren't going to have it seed as much. But we did allow the white clover. We moved, maneuvered around the white clover because it's accumulating nutrients and it's fixing nitrogen with its bacterial symbiotes and providing pollen and habitat. So uh, we wouldn't just mow everything. We did try to select just the grassy areas to mow. And that's the end of May. So this is the end of spring 2011 